So I'm going to start off with just what we're even talking about. Like, why is this important? Um, and I apologize for those of you eating. I'm going to show a quick clip of exactly what Ag Ag is all about. Um, this is a video from a, a Wisconsin dairy farm um, that an uh, undercover video uh, captured of, of some cows being abused um, and resulted in some charges. But I'll, I'll uh, start it here. It's about a minute and a half long.
That's a, that's a knife you probably actually stabbed in the ass there. Um, sorry to subject you to that, but I think it's valid to see kind of what we're talking about here. Um, so there's been a lot of these undercover investigations, and they've been highly embarrassing to the industry. Uh, I want to start off, um, just full disclosure, I myself manage a farm that's been in my family for the last 177 years straight. It's a child we had all sorts of owls, now it's all corn and beans, edamame, as I like to say, uh, but soybeans and corn. Uh, but my, um, you know, it taught me at a very early age sort of the idea of husbandry. I don't know if people know the, the derivation of the word husbandry. It comes from the Norse word who's bond, which means bonded to the household. And the idea was that the better you treated the animals, the more productive they would be for you. part of your household. You treated them well, they would be productive. Um, and Bernie Rollin writes about how after World War II, the advent of antibiotics, bless you, um, uh, we were, industry was able to start treating the animals much more poorly, but just jacking them full of antibiotics and other things, and still having them be about as productive as they were when they treated them well. So interestingly, you see, bit by bit, you see then, uh, University Departments of Animal Husbandry start changing their names to Departments of Animal Science. And Rowland points out that it's sort of right at that juncture is where welfare was sort of removed from the equation and the welfare of the animals was no longer a concern. Um, this is from Kansas State University. My great, my grandma's brother, my great uncle Charlie was a well-known uh, dairy professor at Kansas State University. So I'm not coming at this completely from the outside pointing fingers. Uh, I have a vested interest in the way that agriculture is viewed and feel that these things are very embarrassing and, 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 and do harm, as you see here. Um, as a whole, media attention to animal welfare has significant negative effects on U.S. meat demand. And so you would think, okay, well, you've got this terrible things that are happening. You've got it being exposed in the media now with, you know, how access to media is, 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 is infinite. Um, you would think you would want to reduce what's actually happening but no, instead, the answer is to, no, we just need to make sure that no one actually sees us doing all these things that the public doesn't agree with. And there's two aspects of it. Uh, Matt Liebman works for ALDF and is very involved in these issues. And we kind of all, all discussed, uh, there's two aspects of this. One is over law breaking. Like everything you saw in that video, most of the stuff you saw is against the law. And those guys, you know, the four workers that commentate were prosecuted and, 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 and convicted. Um, but there's also things that are not illegal, but are still very embarrassing and to the industry because the public doesn't agree with. You know, I'm going to try and switch up here. Get bear with me. I thought this might happen. So, let's see if I can get this back going here. Uh, over here. All right. All right, I'll keep trying. Sorry. Um, I may be way better than getting back. Okay. Um, so what the, the response has been is like, okay, we need to we need to shut down. We need to make sure no one sees what we're doing. Rather than like stopping this law breaking, stopping this thing, we need to actually just keep people from seeing that we're breaking the law. So as you've seen here, in the uh, last couple of years, there's been 20 different bills uh, introduced across 14 states. Um, every single well, the good news is that every single one of those, except for one, uh, were defeated by the combined efforts of various animal protection groups. Um, and the one that did pass, as Justin will explain, uh, was a filed suit against pretty much within I think a month of it of it passing the law. Um, and there were two other bills in Colorado and Vermont that we prevented from even coming up, although Colorado may come back. So how did this get started? Um, so the first ag gag laws were actually passed uh, in. You know, 24 years ago, 1990-1991, in Kansas, Montana, and North Dakota. And these were sort of promoted as, that's sort of eco-terrors, a lot of the sort of lab burnings and things like that. And they had these, carried these names such as the Animal Research Facility Damage Act, or you know, Farm Animal and Research Facilities Protection Act. It's interesting they call it a Farm Animal Protection Act, but it's actually not protecting farm animals from the others. Um, and these were sort of kind of anti-trespassing laws 
meant to prevent folks from kind of sneaking in and obtaining footage uh, without permission uh, and, and doing quote unquote damage to these agricultural facilities. Um, but under the, the definition of damage, that did include uh, taking photographs and making recordings. And so you see here from these laws, Kansas was the first one, um, makes it a crime to enter a facility and take pictures, photographs, video, with the intent of causing harm to the enterprise. And that's a very broadly written, the intent of causing harm to the enterprise. Like what, what does harm mean? Um, Montana, similarly, uh, uh, crime to take pictures or video, uh, with the intent to commit criminal defamation. That's interesting because, you know, defense to defamation is that it's true. Uh, and so, kind of by definition, videos and photographs, unless they've been altered, it's factual. So, not really sure what they were trying to accomplish there. Uh, North Dakota, uh, very similar, um, you know, makes it a crime to enter and, uh, and attempt to use a camera or use a camera. So, that was 20 years ago. That basically, everything halted there. Sort of like, before, you know, Ebola in the past, on the news lately, Ebola in the past would have trouble spreading because it was so deadly that it would kill everyone so quickly that it would kind of pop up, kill a bunch of people and disappear for a while again. So this kind of popped up, made a bunch of, and then just, that was it for the next couple decades. Um, so then there's, there's been a recent resurgence uh, in what we call ag gag legislation. And uh, probably due to a group called ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. Uh, how many here are familiar with ALEC? So, for those of you who aren't, uh, they were founded in 1973. They're sort of a, a conservative corporate bill mill that uh, creates a lot of very conservative model legislation. Uh, they're responsible for the Parental Consent for Abortion Act, uh, the Stand Your Ground uh, gun laws in Florida and other states that created the climate that led to the death of Trayvon Martin. Um, Arizona's extreme immigration law, where police and force, law enforcement was charged with checking everyone's papers, um, and currently they're very involved in voter ID laws, uh, trying to uh, impede the free exercise of individual voting rights. So they drafted, back in 2002, drafted something called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, which, again, how many people are familiar with that? It's, it was seen very negative, and this is you know, the year after 9-11, so this was something that was passed uh, and essentially equating animal activists with terrorists. And anything with terrorism in the title was going to sail right through. There was no way people, people were running against that. Um, and so they created this model bill, and, and one of the provisions of their model bill for the ATA was uh, creating a federal felony uh, to enter any research facility or uh, animal facility and filming, um, again, with the intent to commit criminal activities or defame the facility or its owner. What's interesting is that you know the ATA is viewed as this horrible, borderline unconstitutional uh, law, and yet this was considered too extreme even for the ATA, so it was stricken from the ATA when it passed. Um, but that was back in 2002, so like you know, a good almost a decade goes by, and Alec folks are like, you know, we drafted this, we've got to sit it around. Why not try it at the state levels? And so they they then. Uh, start trying it and, and, and introducing these bills to states. Uh, I think 2011 was the first year they introduced four of these bills. Not in the past, but it was their way of testing the water. Um, and what these new, this new, I like to call it ag 2.0 bills, uh, some of the elements are, one, just criminalizing the recording right off the bat at any uh, facility, even by long-term employees. So say you've worked somewhere for a while, all of a sudden new management comes in and there's overt law breaking going on. If you document that and take it to the authorities, in Utah and Idaho, you're actually breaking the law. Um, criminalizing, and then there's on the front end, to keep people from even getting into the facility in the first place, they will criminalize obtaining a job at a facility under, under, under false pretenses or with the intent to disrupt operations. And again, disrupt is not usually defined anywhere, so these are very frightening because they are so broad. Um, and in three states, that's illegal. Uh, the other, the last one, <laughs> <laughs> is uh, requiring what's called a quick reporting of suspected abuse uh, within a certain time frame. Um, Missouri was the first law to do this, and it's within 12 hours. So if you film this abuse going on, you have to turn over almost immediately, and I'll, I'll get into what they're getting at there, uh, and turning over all your evidence. Um, so the result of all this has been 24 states it's in this sort of new resurgence, AGA 2.0, in the last four years, 24 states have introduced these bills. Um, four of them were enacted into law. So when you add that to the three that existed from the early 90s, you've now got seven states that have ag-ag laws. 
Um, and I exclude Arkansas and South Carolina. You will see somewhere that some folks do include those. Uh, Arkansas had a, an ag gag bill that was essentially gutted, but it kept the scary name of, I think it said something like, uh, um, I can't remember exactly. It was, it was only law enforcement can investigate animal cruelty or something like that. But it ended up basically being like a forfeiture bond issue. So it has a scary ag title, but it's not actually an ag law. South Carolina does have some uh, impingement on fraudulently gaining access to a facility, but they don't really address any recording. So we kind of internally don't consider that one to be an ag law. Um, so here's the, the current map of where they stand. The red states are where ag laws have passed. Uh, the uh, kind of mustard color is where they've been tried and have failed. Um, so, uh, and these are the, the first ones I was talking about, you know, Florida, <coughs> Iowa, um, Minnesota, and New York. Sorry, because I made some changes, I'm showing you. Um, so that was, that was 2011. So 2012, this is what the map looked like. These are the ones, and this was the year that three of them actually passed. Uh, Iowa, Utah, and Missouri. And Justin's going to talk more specifically about, about the Utah bill. Um, in 2013, the animal advocate says, OK, we can't let this happen again. Everyone got a lot more organized and more mobilized. And there were 11 bills introduced that year, uh, but none of them uh, were able to pass. And so all of them were defeated by the broad coalition of folks that were working on this. Um, I have Pennsylvania in brackets because uh, the Pennsylvania legislature actually reconvenes on Monday. And uh, nothing's ever quite over till it's over. I mean, it never made it out of committee. It's introduced by Democrats or Republican legislature there. But as I'll show you coming up, you just can never quite be sure that something's over until the session actually ends. Um, Missouri is an awful state for animal legislation. There's a group called the Missouri Alliance for Animal Legislation. Uh, Bob Baker, and you know, a lot of states that have these groups like, hey, here's all the great stuff we got done this year during the session. Missouri's are like, you know, the, the last one had like a little dog peeking out from under the sofa and says, like, it's safe for the animal. The, the session ended. Like, here's all this crazy crap we killed. Like, it's finally safe for the animals to come back out. Um, literally, they, like, last year in Missouri, they had a bill introduced that would allow people to spay and neuter their own pets. Oh, oh my God. God. It's a puppy mill industry because uh, they don't want to pay veterinarians. Uh, anyway, uh, so this year uh, there were nine ag ag bills across uh, seven states. Tennessee felt the need to introduce three of them. And just go back here to 2013. Um, none of them passed, but some came really close. Uh, my actual first day in the job at ALDF was May 13th, which is in addition to being my mother's birthday, was the day that Governor Haslam vetoed the Tennessee law. Um, that was passed by both both houses of the Tennessee legislature, Southern State and uh, Monterey Academy State, and that took a lot of guts for uh, for a governor to veto that. Um, and much of it was due to a great uh, opinion from his attorney general that said, you know, we don't think this. I think this may not actually be constitutional. Um, so this year there were fewer, uh, and Idaho, as I mentioned, was the only one to pass. We got another couple shelved. Um, but you know, Pennsylvania just can't can't count any chickens, as they say. Uh, so what I'm going to do? There's a lot of stuff you can go and kind of look up all those laws and read the specifics of the Iowa Missouri laws, and and Justin's going to get a little bit more into Utah and Idaho. But what I thought I'd do is just kind of give you a behind the scenes look at what actually goes on when these bills are introduced and all the machinations, and just to give you kind of an insight into the process. Uh, so I'm going to do three case studies of bills that were introduced this year. Um, New Hampshire, Arizona, and Kentucky. Um, so another, besides ALEC, the group that's actually the sort of most vocal mouthpiece about ag gag laws uh, are, is a group called the Animal Agriculture Alliance. Um, Emily Merritt, this is her main spokesperson, and she's been on with Will Potter, there's a, a Democracy Now! episode for a full hour where the, the two of them were on. I don't think it's fair to call what she was doing debating, but they were discussing these issues. Uh, and Kay Johnson-Smith's her CEO, and she's actually said that these quick reporting bills that I referenced earlier will be the centerpiece of the AAA's 2004 legislative strategy. And she, kind of borrowing from New York's uh, anti-terror uh, rhetoric again, says, you know, all we're trying to do is make sure that animal cruelty is reported. If you see something, say something. It's that simple. Well, 
it, it's not really that simple. What they're actually trying to do is say, if you see something, say something, so we can immediately, immediately identify you, fire you, and make sure you don't see anything else. Uh, the anal uh, uh, and the, there's another analogy for that I'll get to. But um, So what you then see is folks saying, okay, well, we've had this trouble with these other bills. Let's kind of pare back some of the overtly unconstitutional aspects of it, of just forbidding to do things, and let's just go to this, this quick reporting. So that's what New Hampshire did. So they entered this bill in January of last year. So you see what the title is. An act requiring persons to record cruelty to livestock to report that cruelty and submit uh, returns to law enforcement agencies. Um, I see any person who records have a duty report and shall submit the recordings within 24 hours. Pretty quick. Um, and this didn't move. And what's kind of even more insidious about this particular, the way this fits into the, the existing cruelty code, is that at the bottom, their, their definition of animal. Uh -huh. It's not <laughs> clear that a domestic animal, uh, that livestock even is considered, uh, it falls under their cruelty statute. So what they've inserted is this thing saying, anyone who sees any of these actions that are illegal to do to command animals, anyone who sees that happening to livestock has a duty to report it. But it may actually not even be illegal, but they're still required to report something that may not even be illegal, which is just absurd. Um, but anyway, this didn't go anywhere, and this was the same year that all the other 13 bills had failed. So in November, they amend the New Hampshire bill. Uh, say, let's, let's make it not as focused on the recording, Let's morph this and actually make it sound like an actual anti-cruelty bill. So now it's an act requiring persons who witness cruelty to report that cruelty, not necessarily those who record it. And if you do happen to record and have any other evidence, you then also have a duty to report that, that you own it to a law enforcement agency. doesn't really mandate that you turn it over. You just have to tell them you have it, for which they probably can then go get a warrant to, uh, or, uh, to, to acquire it. Um, but it must it mandates that you do keep an unedited copy for 60 days. So you would think, okay, well, you know, we have mandatory cruelty reporting requirements for veterinarians. Like maybe actually forcing people to report cruelty might be a good thing. And one idea is that if you're filming this, and all of a sudden you see the facility manager or owner or other people watching this, technically they're violating the law. If they're, if they're witnessing this cruelty and they themselves are not reporting it, then you have them as well. But no, so look what they do. And the first part, witness is another person that gets around the sort of uh, for, uh, compelled testimony, you know, self-incrimination, that if you say like a crush video or something, if you yourself are, fil are filming this and are forced to turn it over, you would sort of be incriminating yourself. Here, so they, they limit it to another person, but in the bottom, look what they do to, to get rid of that exemption. It shall be a defense to prosecution or the section if the person witnessing the act of cruelty, aka the owner of the ag facility, reasonably believes his or herself to be criminally liable for the conduct of the actor. So they basically exempt out any plant managers, plant owners. Insidious. Um, so what happened? And the other thing is, so we went and said, well, look, if this really was about trying to prevent cruelty to animals, why just limit it to livestock, who may actually not even fit under the code? So what happened is that uh, the large coalition of, of organizations got together, uh, over 70 groups, uh, lots of individuals, national groups, local groups. Um, yeah, this is on sorry, I saved, the, I saved the current version to my uh, thing here, sorry. Um, so in, as, as, as Will pointed out yesterday, a broad-based coalition of groups. You've got animal welfare groups, civil liberties groups, you know, food safety groups, environmental folks, uh, workers' rights, and, and First Amendment groups all opposing this. What's interesting is New Hampshire, pretty tiny state, right? 400 members just of the assembly in New Hampshire. That makes it the fourth largest English-speaking legislative body in the world, behind the British Parliament, the Indian Parliament, and the US Congress. Uh, so it's, that's a lot of work. So everyone gets together and we split it up. I think there were 10 different groups, ASPCA, HSUS, Compassion for Killing, Farm Sanctuary, Mercy Ground. Everyone gets like, okay, you take 40, there's 10 different groups, you each take 40. And so we just sat down and started calling these folks, and many of them are at home, they don't have offices, they're a lot of part-timers. And uh, it was really fascinating because you know many of them hadn't heard about it, so it's great that you get to be the first one to kind of inform them on this. But the ones that had, I was like, well, yeah, why wouldn't I be, why wouldn't I support reporting livestock cruelty. So you could see that this actually strategy was kind of working. I was pretty worried about this, to be honest. Uh, it seemed like a pretty wise strategy on the other side's part. 
But uh, luckily, they didn't fall for it, and the bill was tabled on January 22nd this year, so it was like the first major victory of the year, a great way to start. And that was added to the King Amendment being knocked out of the Farm Bill, and also horse slaughter being uh, inspections being defunded. So like January was a really good month for the animals legislatively. Um, so, uh, um, so next one I'll focus on is Arizona. And this was a much broader sort of anti-livestock bill. And what had happened is that the Arizona Cattlemen Organization, they're very powerful, throw a lot of money around in Arizona. Um, and what you see a lot of times is cattlemen groups and Farm Bureau will go in and kill any animal protection uh, law, uh, even if it doesn't even address farmed animals, because they just worry that it's a slippery slope, camels under, nose under the tent, all the you know, efforts that you hear. Um, and they just think anything that improves the welfare of animals will eventually come back to reduce uh, uh, and impinge what they're able to do to their own animals. Um, and so the year before, 2013, there was a companion animal bill that just added a couple small things. It added uh, uh, hoarding, made hoarding a crime under the cruelty statute, and also had a discretionary allowed of judges to mandate psychological evaluation and counseling for someone convicted of cruelty. But it was still only discretionary. They still killed it. So what they did is they then went to the sponsor of that 2013 bill and said, hey, let's, let's, let's make a deal here. We'll let you have your little thing, you know, hoarding and, and psych evaluation in return for us adding in our sort of top 10 wish list of things we'd like to be able to keep doing to our livestock. And so, name and names, Representative Brofer McGee, she took the deal. And then she went public and said, everyone was involved, all the stakeholders were at the table, Complete falsehood. Uh, not one single uh, representative of the humane community was involved, and there's a lot of them in, in Arizona, uh, was involved in this at all. It was just released. And so I'm not kidding when I said it was a top 10 wish list. It's maybe hard or difficult to read. Um, so in return for the hoarding and the and psych evaluation, you would have livestock being completely removed uh, from the existing anti-cruelty laws uh, and instead creating a new sort of separate but equal section of the code that they would be put in. Um, and again, there can be no other reason from removing livestock from the existing cruelty code unless you then wanted to treat those two categories differently, if you wanted to treat companion animals and livestock differently. Otherwise, there'd be no reason. So they obviously, that was what they were aiming for. Um, second, we require uh, evidence of livestock cruelty to be turned over within five days. Here you go, the quick reporting ag thing. So you see the first New Hampshire bill was 24 hours. The amended bill was 48 hours. It still didn't work. So now I'm like, well, let's keep pushing the envelope and just find out what the public's tolerance is in five days. And again, these really resonate. So when I was testifying at the hearing for this, um, five days, that seemed kind of reasonable. Uh, and one of the, uh, the representatives said, well, look, say that you knew a child was being abused. Um, and filming it, would you allow that abuse, that sexual abuse of that child to continue just so you could get additional video footage? You know, there's a lot of, you know, comebacks to that, but it's still, you can see that people who wouldn't think it through all the way, that, those arguments really can resonate. Um, uh, another thing it would have done, done is completely forbidden uh, police and sheriffs from uh, investigating or, or, or charging or even investigating uh, cruelty to livestock. So not only you put it in its own code, but they're not even allowing you to investigate it. Um, and instead put, uh, you know, sole discretion within the Department of Ag, Arizona Department of Ag. Arizona Department of Ag only has eight investigators for the entire state. Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who has his own issues, but he's actually strong on animal stuff, he said he has 13 folks just in Maricopa County investigating this stuff, and yet you're going to prevent him entirely from investigating livestock cruelty? And also wasn't certain whether horses were considered livestock under this definition because so much of this wasn't defined. So you could have a horse starvation case and you've got local law enforcement having their hands tied not even being able to investigate it. Um, again, they would have also prohibited cities and counties from enacting stronger uh, livestock cruelty laws. Would have had a whole other host of exemptions, normal good husbandry practices. You hear a lot of these work animals, exempting all work animals, even from this like separate reduced category. Um, Exempting activities including you know, tra transport, uh, hunt, ranching, farming. I mean, these are very, very broad exemptions. And these are exemptions, like I said, even from the reduced second thing. Um, but here's where the lines really comes in, what they're actually trying to do. Look at the last one. They would have reduced cruelty to livestock from an existing felony down to a misdemeanor. 
Bless you. So that actually shows what they're really trying to get at here. They just want to be able to do whatever they want to animals. And so, uh, so this was smart because what they did, they asked for the they asked for the moon, and one by one they would just check off these. Like so, whatever had a problem with uh, so Sheriff Joe, he's a very powerful figure in Arizona, came out and said, "Yeah, this is absurd." You're going. So they get rid of the uh, they get rid of C. So okay, fine, we'll let law enforcement investigate this. You know, the animal community was. Most incensed about the ag gag five day provision, so they get rid of that. Um, and then reducing cruelty to livestock, there were a couple legislators that were really upset about that, so they get rid of that. So eventually, they whittle all this stuff away. What's interesting is that as they will this way, eighty percent of Arizona voters oppose even the basic thing of removing livestock and poultry from the existing cruelty code. That's a pretty stunning number. Uh, Arizona is, uh, you know, largely rural state as well, and. What's more interesting is when you sub when in deeper into those numbers, uh, no matter how you subslice it by um, rural versus urban, uh, Democrat versus Republican, male, female, gender, race, income, the smallest percentage of Arizona voters that opposed taking livestock out of the cruelty code was eighty percent. So eighty percent of Republicans, eighty percent of white males, uh, all of them oppose this. Um, and so that's really powerful when you're going and speaking to a legislator saying, you know, you're about to do something that 87% of the people in your district disagree with. Um, interestingly, Arizona was also the second state to pass a ballot initiative regarding confinement, uh, the standards of confining uh, farmed animals. Um, and that's a great way of kind of just going around. If you've got a legislature that's been largely captured by a group like the Cattlemen, you can go around with a ballot initiative and just go straight to the public, and they themselves can can decide. And that's what happened, and that really scared the pants off the the ag industry there. Um, so it got to the point where so many of these the nefarious things have been crossed off that even our the coalition's own lobbyists were recommending that we we shift to neutral uh, rather than continuing to oppose this. Um, the rationale being that. Uh, because Sheriff Joe was now on board, because Cal wanted to throw a lot of money around, there were animal-friendly legislators that still were going to feel the need to vote uh, vote for this bill, and we didn't want to burn those bridges. But it also highlighted that sometimes contract lobbies can kind of have an agenda of their of their own. I mean, they're, they're having a, a long-term career. You're but one client of them in this one year, um, and they need to preserve kind of relationships themselves. So they didn't want to be seen as burning a lot of these folks. And so we had some very serious, intense conference calls among the coalition members about you know what we do here, and um, and we stuck to our guns. We said, you know what? There's no way we can go back to our organization supporters and say, yes, we we we're not going to oppose taking livestock out of the cruelty code and ghettoizing them to their like separate but unequal uh, area. And there's. Um, and you know, and you can see the other good thing here. What they were really trying to do here, fundamentally, was test the waters to see if uh, legislators and the public were willing to essentially throw livestock under the bus to win just a couple of small protections for for cats and dogs. And as someone who has pretty much worked almost exclusively on companion animal issues for the previous ten years, companion animal evaluation specifically, I'll be the first to admit that cats and dogs are the most protected, pampered, four-legged creatures in this country. I already have a bunch of protections. And so to, to give them a couple extra little small protections in return for severing the one thin thread that livestock have protecting them, uh, it's just very encouraging to see that no one fell for it. Like, no one in the animal community took that deal. And as you see the public, 87% of the public uh, disagreed with that. And so, yeah, we stuck to our guns, and the bill died. Now, the bill didn't die necessarily through the great work of all those animal organizations. We worked extremely hard, but it looked like we were going to lose this one. And that's why the lobbyists were recommending we shift to a neutral on it. And we're like, might as well at least go down fighting. But it just so happened, and this is the great thing with legislation, you just never know. There's things that come out of the woodwork. You just never know what's going to happen, and you can't control it. Uh, the main Senate sponsor, so it passed the House, passed the House Committee, passed the House, passed the Senate Committee, goes to the Senate, um, and the lead Senate sponsor, during the budget, they, they, everything goes on pause while they all fight over the budget, got in a big, I think it, I think the technical term is pissing match with the uh, President <laughs> of the Senate. So the President of the Senate's like, retaliation, like, okay, wise guy, I'm just not going to let your bill come up for a vote. So that's what happened. So at 1.42 a.m. Uh, on April 24th, the Arizona session ended without the bill coming up for a vote. So sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you get skillful, but either way, we ended up we don't win this one.
Um, so the last one I'll look at is Kentucky, just to give the, the example of just how crazy it can get. Uh, so five days before the end of the session, this is why I say you can't kind of relax on, on Pennsylvania. Um, there's a bill that Joni Jenkins had introduced uh, to ban gas chamber euthanasia. The main study in the United States was very much involved in that. Um, HB 222. Five days for the end of the session, the Judiciary Committee lets that off the committee, but only after adding an anti-abortion amendment. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, I get permission to this one. So here you are. <laughs> sorry, I'm going to go in the so all of a sudden, five days during the session, you think everything's cool, you think all that everything's winding down. All of a sudden, like, holy crap, there's an agate bill. So everyone has to mobilize, people have to fly in for hearings, drop everything they can, and, and try and, and try and kill it. Um, so so that, that was that. Dogfighting bill, right? No kidding. The Judiciary Committee let it out only after adding an anti-abortion <laughs> amendment to a dogfighting bill. My joke was that's the one pro-animal bill in Kentucky that the breeders might actually support. Um, <laughs> inside joke, and the, the dog breeders oppose every piece of animal legislation. Uh, so both of those were introduced by Representative Joni Jenkins. So what happens here is that she then had to turn around and work to kill both of her own bills that for the entire legislative session, all the major animal groups have been sitting on action alerts, hey, tell your legislator to vote for, you know, HB 222. And all of a sudden, like, after have to throw in reverse and spend an additional amount of research telling you, no, 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 we need to kill this now. Um, huge resource drain. And so the subtle message here was, in Kentucky, like, don't waste your time trying animal protection legislation because we're just going to do some crazy thing to, to kill it. So kind of the three things you see here by these three examples, um, in New Hampshire, they tried to do sort of like the wolf in sheep's clothing thing where we take this anti-animal bill, but we'll gussy up and actually make it look like an animal protection bill. Like, you know, see something, say something, right? Then you had Arizona where they're like, okay, well, let's actually just like go make a backdoor deal. So we'll take an actual pro-animal bill and just add a bunch of anti-animal stuff to it. Like I said, hoping that folks will, will willing to throw livestock on the bus. Look, it didn't work. But here you have, take it to a whole other level, where you have existing positive pro-animal animal protection legislation that they just go in and aggressively attack and add their own amendments to in order to kill them. Um, so, as you will hear shortly, uh, lawsuits were filed. And the one, Justin's going to talk more about this, but the one thing I want to mention is that there was a lot of discussion, there was actually some resistance to filing this lawsuit, challenging the constitutionality of the Utah Ag Act law, because we had been so successful legislatively that previous year. There were, uh, you know, I said 11 and 0 uh, at the state level. Um, but are, are there are a couple thoughts there. One was that the constitutional arguments are only but one of several arguments that we have against, uh, as, as, as Will Potter laid out yesterday, yesterday. There's a bunch of different arguments. There's, you know, but just general, uh, you know, public policy arguments. There's sort of a lot of different, that the people just vote. So the idea of having an anti-whistleblowing, if you've got something to hide, most people are, feel that sort of semi-un-American. Um, and so we still have, so we, if we lose, okay, we may lose one of the four or five arguments we have against ag -Gag. Uh But the other thing is that um, the actual, ex but if we win, ag, -Ag maybe goes away. And then all these organizations, instead of spending all these resources having to play defense and parachute in and fight all these ag, -Ag laws, can actually spend those resources trying to move forward and do positive things for the animals. Um, and I always felt, too, that just the mere existence of the suits would have a great showing effect. So if you've got a state that wants to introduce it, it's like, hey, you got two suits being sued, uh, states being sued over this now. Do you really want to bite that off? Much better to sit back and wait a couple of years until it works its way through the courts. Um, again, Amy Meyer, she's the plaintiff in the Utah suit, obvious terrorist, as you can see. Uh, and here's what she witnessed. Um, the suits, I'll place through these. But the thing is, people ask, like, okay, what can I do? I'm just one person. Um, as I pointed out, Kentucky, being the poster child, they've consistently ranked dead last. The Animal Legal Defense Fund, the group I work for, they do annual rankings of the state animal protection laws. They're consistently dead last. Um, and that was, there was another animal protection bill that came up, and they were offering to say, hey, you know, one of the, the motivations for that was saying how they're dead last. The Kentucky houndsmen, the people who hunt animals with dogs, I uh, have an audio recording of this. I wish to God it was video. Uh, they're saying at their annual meetings, like, you want to hear all these ads and stuff, how Kentucky ranks dead last when it comes to animal protection. And we intend to keep it that way, like literally bragging over their dead last thing. 
In contrast, my home state of Illinois, I'm proud to say, has consistently been number one in our animal protection laws. And it's all due to one person primarily, Lee Dan Cabbage, who formerly the ASPCA is now at Best Friends. She single-handedly drafted and got past 24 pieces of humane legislation. Um, so she was like, you know, what can you do? Write letters and make phone calls. Uh, as folks in this room can attest, legislators say if they get five phone calls on something, they're like, wow, this is a pretty big issue. If they get eight phone calls, they're like, holy crap, I need to jump on this right now. Eight phone calls. It really is. So few people do actually engage. So when you see they're having a, you know, humane lobby days, go to those. Learn the process. It's amazingly demystifying, and you really can't have an effect. Um, so participate. There's a bunch of uh, animal protection legislative groups. Uh, Missouri Alliance for Animal Legislation, uh, Minnesota Board for Animal Protection, Texas Animal Legislative Network. Be involved. As you see here, uh, Missouri Legislature, you know, you've got to be able to sustain movement. And whereas litigation is often in competition with each other, it's been so heartening for me to see, to, jumping into this job, how collaborative all of the animal protection groups have been. Uh, they, it's, legislation is not just a numbers game, it's a perceived numbers game, so everyone knows that they need each other to get stuff passed, and so that's been great. So thanks a lot, ran a little bit over. Um, yeah, thanks for time. Thanks, Chris. I want to talk about the egg gag laws in sort of three ways, I'm focusing on the third, which is sort of the legal strategies and the legal claims. But uh, I think it is important to reiterate some of the things that Chris said, that is kind of the why they exist and uh, what can we expect of them. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, ALDF and uh, other groups' involvement in the litigation, and then talk about uh, the content of the claims, and then leave some time for questions. Um, the term ag gag is, is a brilliant term, right? It, uh, is, is a term that captures a lot of things. In litigation, we look for ways to characterize the other side's position as unreasonable in a, in a concise, pithy way. Uh, and the term ag gag is, is great for that, right? It's, it's a much greater, Mark Bittman uh, termed the, uh, coined the term in 2011, New York Times food writer. Uh, and I'm considerably more happy with him coming up with this term than his uh, silly book, The Hidden Before Six. So, he's sort of <laughs> hidden before six. so I, I appreciate this contribution of Mark Pippin. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a powerful weapon in, in the litigation, actually. It's something that to have a single phrase. Um, because we can all understand it, right? And in talking to others about what egg egg laws mean, uh, we have this one term, and it, relative, it is relatively self-defined. I think judges reading papers understand it. I think legislators understand it. Uh, and, and certainly, um, those of us litigating it can tell you that the other side hates the term. And they spend lots of verbiage, actually, in briefs trying to say these aren't egg egg laws. This isn't what Mark Fettman meant. Uh, I think that's fascinating, right? But the, um, to, to provide a simple definition, right? Ag obviously refers to agriculture, and gag means just what it says, right? To silence, and we're talking about silencing whistleblowing, uh, the type of things that Chris was showing us on videos. Silencing whistleblowing in an entire industry, the agricultural industry. Um, but like most bumper sticker sort of phrases, um, you know, I oppose ag gag or something like that. Ag gag is an imp imprecise term, right? It doesn't do all of the work that we want it to do. Um, and some of the work that it doesn't do is that it, it really kind of understates what these laws are. It understates how broad their effect. Um, so when you think about an ag gag law, or you were describing that to a relative or a loved one, or why we might have problems with them, I think you would uh, conjure images of um, a slaughterhouse or a dairy, like uh, Chris presented, right? And you'd say, well, that's, that's the whistleblowing that they are trying to criminalize. Uh, but to take but just one example, and an example that we're having um, some success in litigating, but the, the Idaho law um, defines agricultural facility, um, and notably it provides seven examples, but the, to, to start the list, it says agricultural production facility includes, quote, without limitation. Um, just the word with the terms without limitation in a criminal statute for anyone that practices for criminal law is a, is a shocking thing. Uh, without limitation is not really the sort of thing we criminalize. Um, and a different topic is exactly in conflict with the rule of lenity. But without limitation includes the following. Some of the things that it includes, um, anyone that processes, packages, or prepares agricultural products for food. What does that include? It includes restaurants, right? Um, we're not talking just about farms. We're talking about anyone that processes and prepares agricultural products. Uh, it also applies to anyone 
that uh, breeds, raises, or keeps, and then it lists, I think, I mean, maybe Matthew can correct me, every type of animal species that exists, fish, animals with fur, um, they just sort of go on through without saying non-human animals. Um, so, I mean, that certainly includes your neighbor's uh, backyard chickens, it includes the pet store down the street, uh, it probably includes uh, roadside zoos. Uh, also applies to um, anyone that handles or applies pesticides, right? So the Home Depot is an agricultural facility insofar as they are handling and transporting pesticides. And uh, as Matthew Liebman, I think, uh, brilliantly pointed out, it probably applies to every uh, state capital or state land that is uh, you know, using herbicide or pesticide on their flower gardens out in front. Um, and to, to make the point clear, Idaho goes ahead and says, um, this statute includes, quote, all public and private lands, right? So anything that is an agricultural facility, public and private lands, falls within the definition. Um, prevalence of the laws, I mean, I think Chris's slideshow is, is one of the most powerful things in understanding this. Uh, you know, the number that always stands out to me more than uh, however we count four or five that have passed since 2010 is that 24 states have uh, considered these laws since 2010. Uh, there's not many legislative topics that 24 of 50 states take seriously in such a short time. I, I don't think. I mean, this is a this is a fairly unique and catching uh, disease. So, um, <clears throat> why do they exist? The last sort of preliminary point I want to make. You know, I think it's in, inescapable. If any of uh, there's a historian James, James McWilliams in Texas who. Um, you know, he does what historians do when he studies the, the work and the, the words of the people, right? like an anthropologist. Um, he has great uh, research on industry blogs. He reads agricultural industrial blogs, uh, from what I can tell, all day, every day, uh, and just minds them for what they're saying. And the uh, rise of, uh, of ag gag laws is one of their most celebrated things. In the years preceding ag gag laws, 2009, 2010, he has a great compilation of them saying things like, these undercover investigations are killing us. Um, these undercover investigations, we need to take them on. Right? We need to figure out a strategy. Um, and this is all part of the narrative, right? I mean, Will has written about it, Will Potter has written about it. Um, but this is not a surprise to them. This is not an accident, right? This is a very concerted effort. Um, quantitative studies confirm the same. Right? It's not just the Kansas State study that Chris put up. Um, there's a study from Purdue, and there's at least one other industry study that I'm aware of that shows that uh, consumer behavior changes fastest and most dramatically when they see a video or they hear of this sort of footage, right? This is the stuff that hurts industry most, uh, and so they want to change it. Uh, and we know that even in the, uh, in the West, right? You think about uh, successful legislative efforts, uh, successful legislative efforts not just to stop things, but to produce favorable laws or referendums often come on the heels of an investigation, right? Um, and so I think industry knows what it's doing. Uh, the fact that 24 states have uh, considered these laws since 2010 is, is, a, is a shocking and scary fact to me. Um, we're grateful for the, for the legislative efforts of folks like Chris, um, but we can only sort of hold off on the legislative front for so long, I think. And that brings me to the second point, which I think you know, could be easily glossed over in a, in a talk like this, but I think it's worth a couple of minutes, uh, which is just how does a, a group like the Animal Legal Defense Fund play a role in this litigation, and how did um, we and they get involved? Um, there's a great legal treatise and sort of a piece of legal anthropology that was published uh, by Scott Cummings at UCLA and my colleague Alan Chen recently on, on the history of public interest lawyering. And one of the most interesting chapters in public interest lawyering uh, chapters in the book and chapters in this history uh, is this idea of how nonprofits work together. How do public interest groups come together um, and share their resources and their talents to litigate an effort? Um, and as you might expect, it's a, it's a sort of uh, mixed history. There have been great successes, but the story of nonprofit collaboration for a shared litigation uh, goal is a pretty checkered history. Um, the book documents lots of examples of fights that have broken out, and the fights take various forms, but they're fights about resources. They're fights about who's going to take credit. There's concerns about one group doing all the work and the other group getting all the credit because of the strong press department. There's lots of history of groups, civil rights, race, and the like, um, being concerned that one group is paying too much of the costs 
One group has a more extreme agenda, whatever extreme means in this field, right? They have a more extreme agenda, and they're going to try to write the pleading of the papers in a way that shapes their agenda. And another group just wants something that's more moderate and more publicly saleable. Um, these are well-documented um, problems. Right? Who's going to control the strategy? Um, and when I, you know, the history of LBS involvement to me is, is a testament to the organization um, because I, I became involved as someone who was interested in constitutional law. Um, Matthew Lehman had already been coordinating uh, a group of, of great lawyers for at least six months. I mean, as soon as, uh, probably before Mark Bittman had coined the term, and as soon as these laws were occurring at all in 2010, LBS was tracking them and brainstorming. Um, I got involved, I think, in late 2011, and naively I thought that this would be uh, an easy thing because I think it is a strong case on the merits, as I'll discuss in a moment. Uh, I thought this was a winnable case, um, and it was naive because the same things uh, plague the, the animal movement as they do other public interest movements, sadly. Uh, it, was, it was an eye-opening experience for me. Um, I had sort of thought of animal lawyers in, in a different vein, that there wouldn't be concerns over turf, concerns over things like that. Uh, and I think we have to all keep our eyes open and remember that uh, at the end of the day, it's about the animals if you want to do animal litigation. And uh, uh, thankfully, ALDS saw that. But it took, because of wranglings, uh, a time period that I'm not at all proud of to file an initial complaint in Utah. I think, uh, um, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it probably took us close to two years to file a complaint. Uh, now it's a complaint that the defendants have ultimately called prolix, which is a term that I take very offensive um, as an academic. You can call me specious, um, you know, all sorts of things, but prolix gets me for some reason. Um, but anyway, so it was, it was a long complaint, but it took nearly two years to get it together and get it filed. Um, that's, that's sort of shocking when you think about the speech that could be chilled during that time. It's the time during which Amy Meyer was arrested. Um, happily, um, under sort of the umbrella of ALDF, and now a number of groups have joined up, the coalition has both grown uh, and become an efficient and well oiled litigation machine. As Chris mentioned, um, Idaho passed a bill this year in February. It was signed into law on February 28th by Governor Otter in Idaho. Uh, and we filed a complaint challenging that law um, just over two weeks later on March 17th. Um, so to, you know, that, that sort of time frame is what big law would strive for, right? I mean, this is, this is suing um, to enjoin enforcement of a statute within weeks of its enactment. Um, so I think that uh, we're all on the right path. Uh, the litigation itself, um, I, will, I will talk about, I mean, it's, it's easy to get way into the weeds on these things because that's, that's sort of where uh, I am with it and it's my nature, but I will try to talk about it at a, at a bigger picture level and then if we want to talk specific questions before people's eyes glaze over, um, Chris or I can do so. Um, but the litigation uh, arises under 42 U.S.C. 1983, right? the, the uh, Federal Civil Rights Era statute allowing for litigation uh, of constitutional injuries, it's essentially tort action. Right? So we filed federal cases in both Idaho and Utah, uh, and the idea is definitely that this is not the limit. These are not the only unconstitutional laws, uh, and these are not the perhaps even the most vulnerable. They are just examples of laws that will ultimately be struck down. Uh, and if the Court of Appeals in other jurisdictions don't follow, then we will um, follow, file suits in those jurisdictions as well. Uh, in both of those cases, the defendants filed motions to dismiss. Uh, and in both of those cases, I'm happy to say now that the motions to dismiss are <coughs> denied. Um, so we're now on the offensive in both states, right? I mean, in both states, it has happened that we have compiled uh, a group of impressive plaintiffs, plaintiffs that are suffering injury, like Will Potter, like ALDF itself, like PETA, uh, and these groups are moving forward, right? These are plaintiffs now that are able to move forward, and, uh, and like I said, we're, it's, it's, the ball is now in our court, right? They, we have survived a motion to dismiss, which in you know, litigation parlance means uh, if we can prove up our case or make legal allegations that are sufficient, these laws are going to be struck down at the trial court level. We have two primary legal arguments against the laws, um, and I'll sort of talk most about the first, um, because I think that's, that's probably where the case will be decided. We have a First Amendment argument and an equal protection argument, uh, as well as a preemption argument. But uh, the first two are definitely where the action is, and they're, they're getting a fair amount of, of constitutional interest generally. Um, the First Amendment claims really take two forms, right? And they take two forms because the laws themselves could be, you know, generalizing about what the text of a criminal statute says is always kind of foolhardy endeavor, but I think it's fair to say that there are two general classes of criminalized conduct. 
things that are criminalized are A, engaging in deception or misrepresentations to gain access. It could be a bunch of different ways, but you're criminalizing the act of lying to gain access. Straight lies to gain access as pretending to be a customer or lies to gain employment, lies about things more nefarious or less nefarious, all criminalized. So that's one type of criminalized conduct that we're challenging in the First Amendment. And the second is essentially recording agricultural production conduct. And that's paraphrasing the language from Idaho. It's a little bit less clearly written in Utah, but they're getting at the same thing. So these are the two things, right? Criminalizing lying to get access and criminalizing the audiovisual recording when you're there, no matter how you got there, lying or not lying. And I don't think, I mean, I don't want to talk about the sort of primer on the First Amendment, but it's to put this in context, right? When we were litigating the First Amendment, there is no kind of set flow chart. I don't think any, I don't think there are too many courses or professors that try to say the First Amendment has one path, right? It is a doctrine that has multiple points of entry. But the simplest way to think about it in this context is to say, you need to identify what the speech is. What is the speech type activity? Why is the First Amendment's free speech clause implicated? And then second, is the law in some form pushing a message or prohibiting a message or impeding a message, advantaging one message over another? That is, is the law content-based or viewpoint-based? Those are the two, you know, at a most basic level, those are the two threshold questions in First Amendment law. Is there actually something that relates to speech here? And is there something that is content-based or viewpoint-based? And if it is both of those things, the Supreme Court almost never will allow such a law to survive. And so that's what we're talking about. That's what the litigation is focused on. So the ban on recording at agricultural facilities. I think it probably strikes most people in this room as problematic under the First Amendment. Surely this is doing bad things. But not surprisingly, the state disagrees, and so do some relatively smart people. And I think the arguments take a couple of forms. But the form that is most common is to say something like, well, that's just recording. That's recording, and as an initial matter, recording isn't speech. It's only speech when you do something with it. Maybe it's that you edit it, which raises some of the constitutional concerns with the requirement of automatically turning it over, the mandatory reporting law. You know, sort of taking away the editorial power from the speaker. But so you're recording it for speech. Well, the problem with that argument, maybe it's obvious to you, but it's certainly not obvious to the attorney generals in some states, so I'll say it. The problem with that argument is that, you know, in the modern era, everyone can be a reporter, right? Everyone can take some role as serving a media function. If you have a smartphone or you have a camera, you can be a part of the media, and you can be a part of an important political debate. So how does that play out? I don't think anyone doubts that if someone in this room is holding up a iPhone, recording me and streaming it immediately to your blog, or to your news channel if you happen to be a reporter, that you are engaging in speech, right? You don't have to be employed by the local news channel in order to have a speech status. You don't have to have press credentials to engage in speech. Well, surely it is no less true if the person is recording me right now and streaming it live in its speech. I don't think that we would say, and I'm quite sure that courts would not say, that the fact of whether it's speech or not is contingent on the powers of cell phone reception. My cell phone has notably terrible reception for whatever reason, and it's constantly dropping calls, and I don't get very good reception generally. So my cell phone would entitle me to lesser speech rights if I don't get reception in this room and was not able to stream it immediately. Surely that can't be the case that it's only speech if I can stream it immediately and not if I have to wait to my car to send it when I get reception. And by the same token, it's not less speech if I wait six months or six days and edit the material. Now again, as I'll mention in a moment, editing it to distort the message is a different matter, but we have laws that prohibit editing to distort the message and making sure that substantial truth is still provided. So I think that the argument that it's not speech, while one that resonates with some people, because if you read the legislative debates, which I have, one of the most repeated phrases in Idaho is, 
I hear these people saying that it implicates the First Amendment. Could somebody tell me what the speech is? Right? Um, some version of that question was probably asked a half dozen times. Um, well, the speech is the recording itself. Right? The speech is the recording, and the speech is the ultimate desire to transmit it. It doesn't even matter if I intend to transmit it. Uh, if I keep a diary, it's what the Supreme Court has said, my keeping of a diary is speech, even if I don't intend to show it to any of you. Uh, so I think we're on fairly strong grounds that it is speech. Having said that, right, this is a novel position. The Supreme Court hasn't said audiovisual recording is uh, speech, and so this is this is a new field of law. But I don't think it uh, I don't think it is something that we should lose on by any stretch. Um, secondly, though, if you don't believe, if you think that that's a stretch, if you think it's a stretch to imagine that recording is speech, that we should just be talking about actually speaking, talking, um, I think that's wrong. But if you if you were to take that position, we have a pr very strong secondary position, which is that this is uh, speech related conduct, or this is. Uh, as we call it, quasi-speech. So what sort of things are quasi-speech? Well, um, I've talked about this case a lot um, with Carter Dillard, the director of litigation, and he has always liked the metaphor, always asks me to include the metaphor in the briefs of the, of the printing press. Uh, and I actually think the printing press is apt in this part of the speech analysis, right? The Supreme Court has held that if there were prohibitions or special taxes on printing presses, that would be unconstitutional. Surely my act of buying a word processor or a printing press is not itself speech, right? Getting a receipt at Home Depot or Office Max or wherever I am is not itself speech. But the court is concerned about impinging actions that will ultimately produce speech. That's why limiting the sale of printing presses affects the First Amendment. Uh, by the same token, whether you like or you hate cases like Citizens United, uh, those cases bespeak a form of uh, conduct regarding speech, right? What is protected? It's not, I mean, in the shorthand in the press, we sometimes say that what that does is it protects, and it, it, it uh, imbues your spending of money with uh, speech qualities. That's not quite what the court says, and it's not what it says in the antecedent cases. What the court says, in fact, is that you are spending money, your spending of money, in order to support a PAC or a political campaign. Uh, is facilitating political speech. Right? We might not like that. We might wish that it could be more limited. Um, but what the court is saying is that when you give money, and you're giving money in order to facilitate political debate or political speech, that is itself as good as, as protected speech. Uh, well, then the same reasoning would apply here. Right? If the recording itself is not speech, then certainly the transmission is. And the recordings that are being done that we care about are recordings that are being done in order to produce public debate. Right? We're, there are recordings that are being done in order to spur a political dialogue about the issues that we care about. Um, so I think in this vein, it's very much the case that this is peer speech. But if it's not peer speech, it is some sort of quasi-speech or conduct into preparatory to speech. So then the question that would come up about these type of laws, and I'm still just talking about laws that criminalize recording of agricultural uh, actions, and I'll get into just a moment in the law to the lies. Um, the second question that comes up is, is it content-based? And why does that matter? It matters because then we get strict scrutiny, almost impassable scrutiny. This is a strict scrutiny that the Supreme Court has suggested is higher than the strict scrutiny you see in uh, equal protection for suspect classes. So a very hard standard to satisfy if we show it's content-based. Uh, the classic test for understanding whether a law is content-based, the easiest way to see whether a law is content-based is if you have to look at the content itself. If I have to read Chris's PowerPoints in order to see whether he has violated the law, it's a strong indication that it's a content-based law. Right? Uh, well, we know that a law that criminalizes the conduct, recording the conduct of an agricultural facility is then content-based. Because how do we know if you've committed a crime or not? We need to look at your recordings. We need to see what you recorded. What is on your camera? If your camera has images purely of the sunset from the beautiful vantage point of your um, cornfield, you've committed no crime. If, however, you happen to catch someone picking corn or spraying uh, pesticide, um, you're a criminal. Right? So it's a very strong textual facial argument. This is a content-based law, uh, and they will fall. fall. Um, we have several backup arguments, and I think um, I'll just mention one, because I think this is sufficiently strong on this point. But first, and, and notable, and a more open question in the, in the First Amendment law is, is the role of legislative intent in defining content base. So the legislative history for these laws is, uh, is a fascinating read. It's a great read. There's lots of pages, but I would encourage you, I'm happy to send it to anyone. Uh, ALDF has transcribed them. Um, they're publicly available. Um, it's powerful stuff, right? And the debate is stuff like, um, we need to keep these animal rights people out of the court of public opinion, 
right? Uh, the animal rights folks have crossed an ethical line for me um, by publicizing this stuff. Um, in a, in a uh, pleading, actually, excuse me, no, in, in legislative testimony in Idaho, the Idaho dairymen have been very involved, which is a great fact for me because I have a number of friends who are uh, vegetarian but not vegan and say, I don't, I don't, I can't go that extra way because of the dairy, so it, it does me a great service to have the dairyman being my uh, greatest enemy in the egg egg litigation. Um, so the dairymen, um, the dairymen actually have been a real source of, of opposition in Idaho, much more vigilant than any organization involving, involving meat itself. Uh, and the dairymen both drafted this bill and fielded the questions during the committee here. I've, I've never, I've never seen something quite like this. I mean, I think you were there, too, but. Um, their lawyer, Dan Stevenson, the Idaho Dairyman's lawyer, drafted the law, appeared before the committee, and the committee chairman sort of had 20 seconds of introductory comments and then said, I'd like to introduce the drafter of this bill, Dan Stevenson, and he will explain it to us, and then we'll take comments from everyone for two or three minutes. So everyone else was relegated to two minutes. Dan Stevenson had 20 minutes to go line by line of what a brilliant and important law this was. And then when anyone else would come up and ask questions, if they were hard questions, the chairman of the committee would actually call the IDA back up to answer the question and say, well, you know, how do you address that? Or how you? So this wasn't even, uh, they didn't even pretend that this was drafted by a legislative committee after thorough, you know, democratic engagement. This is a law brought to us by the IDA. If you have any questions, please contact them. Uh, we plan to pass it. Right? Uh, and that's very much the form of the debate. Uh, and the legislative history is, is that clear. And so I think it's very good for us. Right? I mean, we don't know exactly what legislative history that would amount to content bias or content based would mean. Uh, but I, I would be surprised if courts could imagine something that looked much better than this. Uh, one of my favorite lines from that debate was the president of the IDA, the Echo Dairyman, said, um, in his view, this law was most important because it will keep the animal rights people off of their soapbox. Um, so, in, in a First Amendment case, it's so politically powerful to say that they use the metaphor of political speech um, for why this law is necessary. It's a, it's a great fact. Um, they gave it to us. Um, so, the second type of speech, in which some people, I think, view as a, as a harder case, uh, is this, this process of criminalizing lies. Right? I think intuitively, many people in this room would say, yeah, but lying, I mean, lying is, you know, it's shady business. Um, a couple of responses to that, you know, both practically and, and doctrinally, second. Uh, as, a, as a practical matter, it's the, it's the tested and sort of tried method of investigative journalists, which American tradition is very proud of, at least in the history books, to use deception, right? Um, these, I mean, one of the things I've often thought would be a great fundraiser for these cases would be, I mean, maybe it's just, I think it probably isn't a good fundraiser for majority, but a, a mock trial of Upton Sinclair in, you know, in the state of Idaho, in the state of Utah. Um, I mean, there's this sort of powerful imagery that, uh, you know, well, let's look at exactly what Upton Sinclair did according to his autobiography. Is he going to prison in 2014? Probably. Um, right? And so, because we know from the, the experience in Utah and other places that they're not afraid to vigilantly enforce these laws. They're looking for an opportunity to enforce these laws. They're eager to do so. Uh, and so I, I thought that that was interesting. And we have to keep in mind that Pulitzer Prize winning journalists have used deception. Right? This, isn't, this isn't the shady fringes of uh, uh, sabotage and other things, whatever you think of that. Uh, right? And I have my own views, which are probably, well, anyway. Um, but, but I think that that's. They're not, it's not that, whatever you think of that, right? It's not that. This is, this is the sort of thing that wins Pulitzer Prizes. Um, so, so that's, so that, that's sort of the practical implications of lying. The doctrinal implications are, as you might imagine, a little bit, a little bit more complicated. Um, the Supreme Court, I think, has said quite clearly that lying is not unprotected. So, uh, this, the First Amendment is often thought of as having these two spheres. There is, uh, valuable speech and invaluable speech. Invaluable speech like um, fighting words, uh, forms of unprotected, go unprotected entirely, right? So we're talking here about things that the Supreme Court has said, we're not going to provide any protection for that at all. And otherwise, it's usually considered valuable. Uh, well, lying falls somewhere in between for the most part. Uh, over, you know, a long course of defamation cases, the Supreme Court has repeatedly said, Lying is not in itself a good. Lying is always in the service of the bad. Right? But sometimes, and as recently as 2012 in U.S. versus Alvarez, Supreme Court said, but we still need to protect it. Right? And why don't we protect it? Because if we don't protect it, we're afraid that we will chill truthful speech. Right? So a couple of things to say about that. Alvarez's lie was a politically useless 
and uh, sort of, you know, ridiculous lie. He was lying about having won the Medal of Honor to, in Justice Kennedy's words, gain some credibility with the, the small political office. He was running for a water board or something like that, right? So he just was a desperate guy for attention, thought that uh, saying that he'd won the Medal of Honor would be a nice thing. Turned out that that was a federal crime, and he was prosecuted for it. Um, the Supreme Court struck down the statute by saying, look, you know, we don't think it's great to lie about having the Medal of Honor, uh, but it's still speech. Uh, of some form. And in fact, you know, plurality of the court applies strict scrutiny. But as I said, the problem that I think we will run into and eventually litigate and win on is that folks will say, but you know, lies, sure, they won, you won an Alvarez, and the court said lies are okay, but they said they don't really like lies. They said they do it because they have to. A case from just this term on standing illustrates the point. Susan B. Anthony, a conservative uh, political group in Ohio, had been running signs that said, uh, Congressman whoever, um, you know, in his election, Congressman whoever had uh, supported government-funded abortions. And in Ohio, as in most states, actually, there was a law that criminalizes knowingly false campaign or political ads during a campaign. Um, so the Susan B. Anthony Fund was not itself prosecuted, the SBA, but they were afraid that they would be prosecuted someday, or that they might be prosecuted. Uh, and so they brought a case, and the Supreme Court recognized that they could be chilled from saying things, even though they thought were true. Right? That it was possible that they may be afraid. They may suffer an injury uh, when saying things that they believe to be true. Maybe they really think that the Obamacare law, which is what they were talking about, creates taxpayer-funded abortions. You know, I'm not a fact checker, so I won't weigh into whether it's true or not true, but that's exactly the point, right? Do you want to parse every federal statute and sort of exert political opinion on whether it was true or false? And they said that would be an injury, and ultimately the Eighth Circuit struck down the law. Um, so traditionally, we are protecting lies in this country because we want to avoid the harm of chilling true speech. But therein lies the interesting part about ag gag laws, because the lies at issue in ag gag laws are not like lying about having a medal of honor. They're not like saying something that's arguably untrue about another political candidate. They are, in fact, truth-enhancing lies, right? These are the sort of lies that serve the goals of the First Amendment. Um, there are categories of lies that do nothing but bad but we might protect them because we don't want to cause bad harm, just like the exclusionary rule of the Fourth Amendment. Lies in the Edgate context have exactly the opposite effect, which is they are serving the purposes of the First Amendment. You think back to first, first year column law, what are the purposes of the First Amendment? To facilitate discussion, to enhance self-governance, to create a marketplace of ideas, uh, a marketplace of debating ideas. That's exactly what the lies by undercover investigators and journalists are doing, is facilitating discussion. Uh, so I think there is every reason to believe that a conscientious court, and the Roberts Court, by the way, is one to a great extent on the First Amendment. A conscientious court uh, concerned about First Amendment rights will look at this and recognize this is not like other lies. And those lies, by the way, gain First Amendment protection. These are more important lies. Uh, and so I think that that's more or less where I will, will end. Um, I should note that the equal protection claims raise lots of interesting issues and are by no means um, frivolous, right? I think we, we believe that we will win on the First Amendment, um, and I think that the, you, know, you may or may not be convinced by the, the sort of line of reasoning that I presented, but I think that the equal protection claims um, derive um, uniquely from a, from a set of what occurred on quadrology of cases that you might remember um, involving animus, right? Sort of Romer, Cleburne, Windsor, uh, and to a lesser extent, uh, you know, uh, blank on the fourth of the moment here. But, but regardless, there are four cases that this report has decided on animus at the moment, and all of those cases recognize that even in the, in the equal protection <coughs> rational basis realm, laws will be struck down if the reason for the law was in substantial part to harm a politically unpopular group. For the reason that I said, the legislative debate in Idaho and Utah and these other states, um, the legislative debate favors a finding of animus like there has not been in any prior public case. I mean, it's, it's a great fact. Uh, and so I think that the uh, traditional rational basis review won't be part of this inquiry. Uh, and so it's not as favorable a review as strict scrutiny under the First Amendment, but it is another. If we did not have a First Amendment in this country, uh, I would still feel confident that these laws would be struck down. Yeah, I was going to ask that actually.
get you literally want to sit there, there's name calling and they're calling the proposed jack wagons and things like that. We don't know what it is, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, not kidding that it, it, you could not have a better case for demonstrating animus in rational for things like that. I should note that the state responded in their answer uh, by being upset that we cited the uh, online slang dictionary to learn what jack wagon was. <laughs> Um, one thing I want to mention that I, I did, didn't be prompted for, um, going back to the quick reporting thing about how I said, you know, it's not if you see something, say something, it's if you see something, say something, so we can silence you. Uh, the analogy I, I would give in the, the hearings for that is that imagine that you have a, uh, a drug distribution syndicate that you're trying to, that law enforcement is trying to shut down. And say it takes you several months to get an undercover DEA agent to infiltrate that organization to try and stop drugs from being imported to this country and distributed. Um, these sort of mandatory work reporting requirements would be the equivalent of requiring that undercover law enforcement agent to reveal themselves the moment they see a five dollar drug buy. So if every time uh, one of your undercover agents it takes you months to to install reveals themselves that by five dollar drug buy, there's no way you're ever going to catch the heads of the car cartels that are bringing these drugs to the country in the first place, or even any of the you know, folks largely distributing them. Uh, it's going to make sure you only catch the low-level uh, distributors. And that's exactly what is happening with a lot of the investigations that happen, uh, such as the, the video I showed you. What happens in the video? Yeah, the, the four low-level workers that you see on date are all get prosecuted. The plant managers get prosecuted. The uh, owner of the facility often doesn't get prosecuted. Um, and so, and they say, oh, these are just the rogue actions of a few isolated individuals. This is a policy. And that's sort of why, that's the retort to the, 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 the legislator making a comment about, oh, if you knew a child was being sexually abused, would you allow to keep being filmed just to get better footage? The argument is that you need, it takes time to build a case to show that this is part of a systemic. Uh, pattern of abuse that they actually being not just tolerated, but they even directed by management ownership. And the classic example of that is the Hallmark uh, case in Colorado, or sorry, California, where um, you have an investigation, you have an investigation, you conduct this investigation, you see all this crazy law breaking, they take it to the USDA and say, oh my god, look at this, after a week, you've got to do something. USDA is like, eh, we don't really see it. They just just goes back for another week. It's another week of the footage showing Instance after instance after instance of horrible abuse and law breaking. USA went, eh, we still don't see it. Go back for another week. Finally, USA went to the city, go to the public. It needs to be singled out footage that the USA showed their shoulders and turned around. And there's already USA inspectors in this facility as well. That led to the single largest beef recall in US history 143 million pounds of beef, 27 million pounds of which was headed for the school lunch program. Um, perfect. Plant gets shut down. Uh, post prosecute, but that just shows you when you've got 143 million pounds of beef in your call, there's no way you can claim that that's the action of a few isolated individuals. It's systemic policy, and it's the stuff you're never going to. And it's not just that it's the animal folks that are trying to drag out these investigations and get you to the footage. Here you're going to the authorities and showing them the footage, and the ones who are charged with enforcing these laws refuse to enforce them. So that's always something I have to go to the public. Um, I'm sure we'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Hi. Um, I have one question about that that final uh, argument we were talking about protecting lions. Sure. Um, you classified it in in a couple ways about why that why that's something important. You mentioned chilling protected speech, and I think you classified lying as I think you said something about truth enhancing lies or um, lies that facilitate um, truth facilitate truth. And I wondered if. Um, if in a legal setting, if that is the way you all would classify that argument. I, I'm only thinking that I can see the opposite side saying, oftentimes we think about our footage, about animal protection footage being edited and therefore it isn't truthful, and you know these are actually not truths that we're facilitating through these lies. And so I wondered if in a legal, in a legal instance, would you classify it as more as lies that are First Amendment speech protecting lies, or would you use the word truth which I can see the opposite side as using as a distracting argument to just try and undermine something otherwise. Yeah, I mean, without getting into that, I have no qualms about using it as truth enhancing as it is in short, so 
and then even the archer pits would be the rhetoric that they are uh, distorted and, and uh, defaced images that uh, have been sliced together to um, conjure up images that are not a reality uh, are groundless. Uh, and uh, it's my hope that eventually, in the not so distant future, um, the people who say those things in a non opinion way, but in a, in a factual way, this is an orchestrated uh, endeavor. We'll lose a defamation case, and we're not going to have to hear it anymore. Uh, but I think more importantly, um, that's that's the importance of the doctrinal point, which is the Supreme Court has been pretty clear that you can't do an end run around defamation. Um, the ultimate harm, the only kinds of lies that are unprotected. There's lots of perjury, um, impersonating an officer. There are lots of lies that deserve no first amendment speech and will never get first amendment speech, and rightly so. And that includes defamation. Right, because I should not be able to defame you with impunity. It's, it's, it, would, it would be a bad thing. Um, but guess what? When I am engaging in speech that has a harmful effect on your reputation, whether it is through video or just written word or something else, um, you have to pursue me through defamation. And defamation is a highly technical area of constitutional law, and there are lots of prerequisites for you to be able to cover, including that my speech was in fact false and probably malicious. And so to enact a law, right, in fact, the criminalizing of these laws, the only damage that flows from these lies is the damage to the industry, which is not in fact caused by any lie. If they could show that there was a lie that then led to a defamatory video, there's certainly room for civil recovery and maybe even a narrowly tailored criminal law. Uh, but this is actually much worse than any of the efforts. Maybe you remember Hustler or Time versus Hill. These were cases where a force like invasion of privacy and inflection of emotional distress were used as end runs around defamation, suing people for causing reputational harm that are going through the gauntlet of, of constitutional limitations opposed to defamation. So when you think about those cases, including that, this is the first time legislation I've ever tried to do an end run around defamation in the criminal law. Right, so, uh, so I'm not, I'm not terribly afraid of that. And I think that the history of investigative journalism and the reporters' committee for freedom of press is an amicus in the case will strongly support the idea that investigative journalists do things. It's not just animal rights activists. Uh, and when they do it, if they are using false, you know, if the images are not substantially true at the end of the day, um, then that organization is in trouble for defamation with without this criminal statute. I have a question. As a non litigator, the some total of my litigation experience has been representing myself in traffic court. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, 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 it's really successful. <laughs> 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 uh, so it seems to me like if you were to say to law enforcement following that up, if you were to say to law because what we're getting at here a lot of times this involves actual law breaking as being captured. If you were to say to law enforcement, oh, you're never allowed to lie. That cops can never lie when they're interviewing a suspect. Sure. They, they, there's, well, there's no way to help everybody to be able to get any convictions. Uh, so uh, it, it seems like a very similar argument to me that, that you can you know, lie where you're lying in a way of getting the truth. I think it's a big, big problem for police a lot, you know, because they perjure themselves on the stand all the time. And a climate of, of lying where lying is condoned leads to a slippery slope. Yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you could, you could imagine that uh, tolerating certain lies will yeah, lead, to, lead to problems. I think that perjury on the, on the stand is entirely different than um, saying to you, you know, look, I hear you have a basement full of uh, child sex slaves, and that's like some Bible perjury on the stand. It's very common. Of course it's common in any, any criminal work, but I, but I don't think it is intimately related to an investigation to find child sex slaves. Right. I mean, uh, one is an injury for investigation, which the court has clearly upheld. The other is, is unprotected in their form. Any other questions? Hi. Um, you showed a, a picture of, of the U.S., basically, with all the states that had yeah. ag, -lag, ag gag laws and had introduced ag gag laws, and Florida, which is the state from which I come, um, was mostly mustered. But it seemed that around the southeast. Yeah, no, that's just. I, I basically at 3 o'clock this morning. Because no one has that out there. I did. So it was at 3 a.m. I was frantically searching for any PowerPoint free. So I couldn't find getting one through this. I got uh, a Photoshop document. And last night I was coloring all those in myself. <laughs> <laughs> so 
of shading on them, so yeah, they're basically two, two colors here. Blue is as a blazing, mustard-ish as like a dragon tail, and red is in the past. So yeah, it's just, I will look at one of those when I'm less sleep I'm worried that in Miami and down in Key West, could they... Yeah, no, it's just straight red line. So it's either like full shades one way or full shades another way. And uh, yeah, there's no, there's no shades. Um, but yeah, you know, so a lot of this is some folks do, including, like, say, Arkansas, incorrectly on their maps. There's a big map, and, and there's a great article on Mother Jones, but they actually have Arkansas as having a magnet law, and it's, it's, it's incorrect. Sorry, you had a question as well. I did, yes. Um, actually, two questions, and feel free to answer one or both of them. Um, all right. Uh, First is, going back to the Kentucky um, House bills that, you know, last minute they tacked on this very, uh, you know, a controversial, very opposite in spirit uh, provision that then everyone had to, you know, scramble, like, defeat it. Um, could you briefly summarize, you know, how that is done? Yeah. How that process works. So this is one of the problems with legislation is that it, you cannot control even a bill's own sponsor. And so you, you would say that I know dairy folks go and they draft this bill and they give it to someone. They give it to a legislator or say one of our animal organizations say, hey, you think this would be a great idea to clarify something in the law. You give it to them, but then the legislator themselves can make whatever changes they want to it. Uh, it then goes to a committee. Uh, that committee has to first kind of the, the small thing about it before it goes to the larger uh, body. And they, those other folks, can introduce amendments. Um, and we can get very strategic with this. We, we will plan, we'll build little trapdoors that, that create this problem that's like, oh, we've got this great amendment, let's solve this problem. And in that amendment, we'll have something else that you know, we're actually trying to get through. I mean, both sides do it. It's, it's, a, it's a crazy process, but it's completely uncontrollable. And that's what's interesting and nerve wracking about, about the legislative side of things. So, yeah, Judge Jenkins, he, they just actively said, okay, we're only going to pass this if, you know, if by attacking this off, which you're going to make, you have to kill your own bill. And just on some of the timing on this stuff, um, the Idaho bill, I think it was introduced at 4 p.m. on Friday. Monday was a federal holiday, and the hearing was at 8.30 a.m. on Tuesday, uh, 8, uh, 9 o'clock a.m. on Tuesday. So you're essentially one business hour between this bill being introduced and the first hearing being held. So, I mean, the idea is you want to, you know, they're trying to keep it in front of being able to go, go to the end. Um, but it has, again, I just want to reiterate how great it's been that, you know, as Justin talked about, some of the litigation and how folks are a little bit more combative. Um, yeah, just how all the animal protection organizations are so great at sharing resources. Uh, even in the answer the ASPCA, you know, we're the ones to pony up and pay for the contract lobbyists there. And we're all split up, trying to split the work as much as possible, but everyone shared. Arizona, there were, I think, you know, uh, uh, again, close to 50 different groups involved. Everyone kind of shared a part of the load. And when we found out what was happening, we all got together and drafted a group statement uh, declaring victory that everyone was able to kind of edit and everyone released at the same time. So no one was getting credit before anybody else. And it's just, it's so amazing to see everyone work so collaboratively. And, and to, you know, not everyone has the resources of the Humane Society or ASPCA or even the have to, and, and yet everyone kind of does what they can and we all get where we need to be. It's, it's, it's really hard to see. Great. Any other questions? Okay, sure. I'll follow it up on that. Um, how much control does the um, legislator that supports um, a bill like that have determining which committee it goes to? Because Illinois recently passed um, a law that regulates uh, commercial dog breeders, and it went to the Agriculture Committee, which uh, you know obviously had some um, eviscerated impacts on what the final bill looked like. Sure. But I'm just curious how that process works. It, it, it varies state by state. Uh, some things that are subject matter wise have to go to certain committees. Uh, I just testified on the bill that passed yesterday uh, in New Jersey to uh